All right, welcome everyone uh, to a webcast on alternative access approaches and techniques for TAVR. We've got an amazing panel today. Uh, I'm Jamie McCabe from University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. We've got uh, Dr. DeBacher, who's from Copenhagen. Um, Dr. Uh, Yadev from Atlanta at Piedmont and Dr. Devaretti also from Atlanta at Emory. All right, so this program uh, is sponsored by an educational grant from Shockwave Medical, and we'd like to thank them for their support. And it's provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education. There are a series of learning objectives today that we're going to review. One is to understand the challenges associated with calcific iliac arteries, particularly when it comes to large bore access. Another is to understand the need for non transfemoral access around. TAVR or TAVI, um, and ident identify various alternative access strategies and perhaps an algorithm to take advantage of that. And the last is to identify approaches for incorporating intravascular lithotripsy um, in TAVR or large bore access cases. We're going to kick it off here with a little bit of data and some conceptual framework to think about this, and we're going to transition to our amazing clinical colleagues to describe some cases and help us understand and appreciate where lithotripsy may come into play. So, first off, it's important to recognize, particularly around TAVR or TAVI, that there have been a series of secular changes. And in particular, these have come around the development of new technologies. So, where Sapien XT required about 20% non femoral access, Sapien 3 is now down to about 5 to 6% non-TF access throughout the United States. And, uh, <clears throat> when one does turn away from transfemoral access in TAVI these days, what we're seeing is that most of that growth or most of the non-femoral access is non-thoracic, meaning it is not surgical access from the LV apex or the aorta, but rather using conduit vessels throughout the body, whether that's the axillary or the carotid or transcaval, et cetera. That's really where we're seeing the growth among this diminishing population of non-femoral access cases. So need for non-femoral access is decreasing, but when non-femoral access is being used for TAVR, it's still more often utilizing the vasculature. And I want to draw your attention to this particular paper, which I found really interesting. So this is a procedural volume and outcome replacement, uh, an outcome relationship for transcatheter aortic valve replacement published in the New England Journal. We're, not, we're gonna veer from the primary message of the paper to look at some of the context of what it did show. Uh, and so first off, within the United States, uh, almost, well, 550 hospitals we're looking at a median per hospital volume of TAVRs of 54 per year. Right? One quarter of United States TAVR hospitals do less than 36 cases per year. And when you take it per operator, you're at basically half of that. So the average or the median United States TAVR operator does 27 cases per year, and a quarter of them do less than 17 cases per year or only a little bit more than one per month. Now, if you overlay on top of that, that 6% non-femoral access rate, you end up with a per hospital median volume of non-femoral cases of three, and a per operator non-femoral volume case load of one and a half non-femoral cases per operator per year. It's a really low number. And Looking at secondary data sources, such as this paper published by Tom Dolly and all in Jack Interventions, of which I was a part, when we looked at tra uh, transaxillary cases, most of which were surgical, by the way, the median number of cases per center in aggregate was two. That's not per year, that's total. And in fact, almost 80% of all centers had performed less than five. So once we start talking about non-femoral access cases, we are talking about relatively infrequent case volumes per center, <clears throat> and that has, that has significant implications. So the need for femoral access is decreasing. When we are doing non-femoral access, you are still utilizing 
the vasculature primarily. But the median per center and per operator experience for TAVR from a non-femoral approach is really small. And when you look specifically at the volume outcome relationships, the strongest volume outcome relationship is not in femoral TAVR, it's in non-femoral TAVR. And that's going back to that same New England Journal paper. So now you've got something that you're, we're doing infrequently, but it has the highest relationship between volume and outcomes, particularly this is with mortality. Um, and this is just another sort of representation of that, showing that again, when, when you're looking at femoral access, the relationship between the lowest quartile and the highest quartile volume, not that dissimilar, whereas in the non-femoral access cases, quartile one and quartile two significantly uh, increased adjusted odds ratio for mortality. So again, just further corroborating this message. Fe Non-femoral access needs are decreasing. When we're doing it, we're not primarily using an intrathoracic conduit. The median per center and per operator experience is small, and the volume outcome relationship in TAVR is strongest when we're doing non-femoral access cases. And in fact, if you look, if you dig into that data a little bit, what you're seeing is that what drives that volume outcome relationship is primarily vascular complications and bleeding. Less so acute kidney injury, stroke, uh, et cetera. So really kind of drives this message home that non-femoral access is itself a little bit more difficult, has a stronger relationship with, um, with mortality. And so on that basis, I think you could say, well, if you're an average volume center and you're gonna do perhaps less than 10 alternative access cases per year, maybe it's worthwhile to focus a little bit more on how to incorporate a facilitated transfemoral access program into your hospital center where the schematics, the process uh, are all very similar to your standard transfemoral where your um, nurses and techs know just kind of how to, things are gonna move along because they're fairly standard. Now there will be times when that's not possible and doing facilitated transfemoral and doing alternative access are not mutually exclusive. But I think there is a strong evidence base there to say, listen, when we need to go uh, it, with a, a suboptimal iliofemoral vessel, can we work with that in a way that we can avoid taking on perhaps higher risk um, non-femoral access? And I have one quick uh, registry uh, slide to show you here. So these are um, data collated by Dr. Devaretti, who's on our WebEx and can speak more to it. But I think the point here is that in this multicenter registry of 42 patients, what you're seeing is all of them had um, intravascular lithotripsy to facilitate vascular access in inhospitable vessels. The, the, the valve delivery success was 100%. The um, vascular complication rates were very low. The vascular, the access site closure method was reproducibly suture or device mediated like you would normally do, really suggesting that it is a viable access, uh, a viable strategy in appropriately selected patients. And I want to give you one quick example of that. This is a case um, that we've done just to sort of speak to facilitated femoral access. You've got vessels that are certainly not terribly bad, but do have some you know, four millimeter segments and 270 degrees of calcification. Quick uh, intravascular lithotripsy facilitates sheath delivery without any trouble. Um, you can see it there. It took almost as long as it took to show it. It was very quick. And that's sort of what we're aiming for with these cases. And that was uh, then per closed media uh, closure without any trouble whatsoever. Just by way of conclusion, let me just reiterate, transfemoral TAVR is generally safer. I think we can all agree to that. Opportunities for non-femoral access are low and they seem to be diminishing as the technology gets better and the sheath sizes decrease. Volume appears to matter, particularly in non-femoral access. So if you're not gonna do more than a handful of alternative access cases per year, I think you should think very carefully about whether or not a facilitated femoral access strategy might be right for your hospital center. Um, and there is, 
evidence that exists now and a growing body of literature that will be available soon that intravascular lithotripsy can demonstrate the ability to facilitate femoral access in a safe and reproducible way. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. DeBacker to give us a, a little deep dive into other alternative access strategies and how they may um, be incorporated into our TAVR programs. So thank you for giving the words. Uh, I will first start also to elaborate a little bit more and uh, show a bit of our own work in Copenhagen on the intravascular lithotripsy or shockwave assisted transfemoral tower. So for first, a very short, small introduction. Uh, which center are we? We are a center in Denmark, Copenhagen, the capital. And as you see, this is the evolution of our volume. So we started in 2008. Currently, uh, now in 2019, we did uh, more clo well close to 400 uh, tower cases. We are with three operators, so we can say we're a fairly large uh, center. Um, interestingly, on these data, you can see that historically we've been always doing most of our the majority of our cases by transfemoral approach, and that's not always been like that in many other centers. As we started with mainly the Medtronic core valve system. It was more obvious to try to look for transvascular uh, access. Whereas, especially in the early days of the Sapien Edwards uh, valve, many centers were also using transthoracic uh, approaches. But as you see now, these are these last, last data I show you here in this graph um, are 2017. 7% of them were done by alternative access. 93% uh, by transfemoral access with just local anesthesia, so no use of general anesthesia here. So last year in 2019, we did our entire TAVR program of nearly 400 cases, um, fully percutaneous, so using uh, the transfemoral approach, also the shockwave or intravascular lithotripsy assisted transfemoral approach for 2-3% to of cases. And then also another uh, transvascular access approach, uh, the trans uh, auxiliary uh, approach, which we do fully percutaneous. And then for the last one to 2% of cases, we use the transcaval approach. And this, these uh, approaches will also be shown later in this, uh, in this uh, program. So of course, a big uh, benefit of uh, going fully percutaneous for us is that we can stay uh, and trim this, these hospitalizations uh, lengths to an absolute minimum, which is critical for us as we are limited in, uh, in bed spaces in our hospital. So as you can see in 2019, 80%, four in five uh, patients uh, of our tower patients were discharged within 48 hours after tower. So this is also a very nice evolution. So a small word about intravascular lithotripsy. Um, well, this is a principle based, it's a based uh, on the principle of calcium disruption by sonic pressure waves. And this was of course first used in urology where calcium stones were uh, fractured by this technology. But this has now also been introduced as a new methodology for a calcified plaque modification, or you can say cracking the calcified plaque in coronary, but also peripheral uh, arteries. So what is our experience in Copenhagen? Over the past 23 or 24 months, we have used this technology in 25 patients. So eight patients we have used it in uh, that would have all also been treated by transfemoral, uh, transfemoral approach earlier, but now with the additional use of intravascular lithotripsy as we have it available, and we think we could diminish uh, the risk of complications. And if we talk about complications, when pushing the, the, the borders in transfemoral approach, we're talking about the risk for vascular rupture or the risk for uh, nasty spiral dissections or creating dissections which can uh, evolve into uh, thrombosis. We also used it in 17 other patients that we would have earlier um, yeah, refused for transfemoral approach and we, which we would have scheduled for alternative access. So what our typical approach uh, is, we use the shockwave 7 millimeter, the largest uh, balloon, and we always in Copenhagen have uh, uh, let this fall by an additional use of a non-compliant balloon, for example, a ZMAT balloon from six, seven or eight millimeters. So this is one example. Um, this is a case where you have on both uh, iliofemorals a 100% circumferential calcified plaque with an uh, intraluminal uh, luminal diameter of less than six millimeters. So in this case, five millimeter on the left hand, on the right hand side of the patient, 
on the left hand side of the patient uh, 4.5 millimeter. So we still dare to treat patients now by transfemoral approach with the additional use of intravascular lithotripsy, uh, even if we have 100% circumferential calcified uh, lesions with only up to 4.5 millimeters. So as said, we, we use a seven millimeter shockwave balloon. What I personally always like is to have a safety wire during the entire procedure coming from the contralateral side, as you can see on the left-hand panel uh, on this slide. And then this can be followed by a, a ZMED balloon. Um, I think in this case, I used an eight millimeter ZMED balloon. As I, my experience is that the shockwave balloon is, is great in uh, making, uh, fracturing these calcified plaques but it's, uh, it's, it's a rather soft uh, balloon, it's a compliant balloon. So in order to really give, uh, dilate up the vessel and make enough space to smoothly introduce your uh, int larger introducer sheet, I prefer to, to let it follow by an, uh, this ballooning uh, with an, a non-compliant balloon. So this case was, uh, and perfectly also the valve was a nice insertion and there was a successful vascular closure with uh, the proglides. Another case where we typically use this in is even though there is not 100% uh, circumferential calcification, um, for example, this case there is 70 to 75% for this of the circumferent uh, calcification on both sides of the iliofemoral uh, vasculature. And then we even accept cases where we have minimum diameters of up to as small as 3.5 millimeters. So these are cases which we, would, we, we wouldn't have accepted. Uh, five years ago for transfemoral approach, but now with the availability of shockwave, we tend to accept these cases now for transfemoral approach. So also here uh, on the left hand side, you see the shockwave balloon, uh, successful tower insertion, and then a uh, final uh, closure, uh, successful closure with the Manta vascular closure device. So in summary, uh, intravascular lithotripsy assisted transfemoral tower is considered uh, in Copenhagen in cases when there is 100% circumferential calcified lesions with a minimum diameter of up to 4.5 millimeter and even up to 3.5 millimeter if it's not 100% but up to 70 to 75 uh, calcified circumference uh, calcification. If it's less than 70 to 50% calcified uh, of the circumference, uh, then I don't think shockwave makes uh, a really, uh, doesn't make any sense to use it. Um, as this is typically best used in really calcified uh, lesions. And as said before, the shockwave uh, balloon uh, is always followed by us by a non-compliant balloon. Sorry, I go back. So in 2019, we treated as said 100% of our tougher patients by percutaneous approach. Our uh, algorithm, we try to see if it can be treated by regular transfemoral approach. If not, we if we can consider it for intravascular lithotripsy assisted transfemoral. If this is not possible, we will uh, look for the trans auxiliary uh, approach. And if this is not an option, uh, we look if uh, transcaval could be an option. So in this way, I go further to the percutaneous trans auxiliary uh, approach, which I think I can uh, immediately continue on. So I think I would like to show here some uh, practical uh, slides how to exactly uh, perform this trans auxiliary percutaneous auxiliary approach. And I think this is a very easy um, approach for, especially if you're a smaller uh, volume center and you're used to uh, major, absolute majority of your cases transfemorally. If you go trans auxiliary, it's basically you don't need any additional tools or gear, you can almost use everything what you're used to, to do by a transfemoral approach. And also the feeling for the operator when performing this procedure is almost the same as transfemorally. So first of all, we start with placing a six French sheet in the, in the radial uh, artery. And through this six French sheet, we introduce a pigtail catheter, a regular pigtail catheter. We bring this uh, pigtail catheter up to the medial edge of the hum humeral head. And this is exactly the place where we want to do, uh, perform the puncture in the axillary uh, artery. And what we typically do for having a good puncture is I like to use both a combination of x-ray and also ultrasound. Um, 
because only using ultrasound you miss typically orienta orientation of your your needle it's not very obvious uh, from where to come but and also using only x-ray you also miss out on uh, on some information so I would advise using both you don't do x-ray a lot just a few seconds sometimes is enough to guide uh, as an additional lens and I always try to do the puncture of the artery here with a puncture uh, my micro puncture set so after you've done the puncture you bring in the micro puncture dilator and you change to a thick French uh, sheet on that moment um, sorry I can go back so here, of course, we always look very good on uh, our um, CT if this uh, vessel is really good, uh, eligible for, uh, for, for trans-axillary approach. And on the right-hand panel, you see this uh, typical spot where we do the puncture with a micropuncture needle. As you see, it's very lateral on the, on the chest, on, uh, on the thorax, almost into the axillary pit. Um, and we have actually our patients just draped with the two arms besides the body. So not uh, the arms in a 90 degree angle uh, with an extra table. No, we just place the patients uh, as regular on, on our uh, operation table. Next, we remove, of course, the pigtail uh, catheter before we place the, well, you can also use another closure device, but typically I like to use the ProGlide uh, closure device system. Anyway, you can also use other, uh, even collagen-based like Manta uh, closure devices. But if you like to use the ProGlide uh, here, then of course it's important you remove your pigtail catheter first, otherwise you risk to shoot the needles through the pigtail. That would not be uh, great. Next, um, after placing the proglides, you can bring in your an eight French sheet, and on that moment, we also insert the safety wire coming from the radial uh, sh uh, six French sheet. And we leave this safety wire. I typically like to use a 0 0.018 wire, for example, a platinum wire, and we place this wire all the way through uh, the axillary subclavian artery and into the descending aorta, and we leave it there for the entire procedure. Through this 8 French sheet, you can uh, try to come with your catheter uh, AL1, for example, catheter to cross uh, the aortic valve, bring in your stiff wire, and then uh, from there on, as soon as you've placed your stiff wire into the ventricle, you can come with your uh, introducer sheet. And what I or also my colleagues typically do is that we do not introduce this introducer sheet further than uh, necessary into the, into the subclavian artery. So typically we only introduce it up to the horizontal part of this subclavian artery and we no, do not let it go across the bend up to all the way into the aorta. This is not necessary, especially if your patient would even have um, an, uh, a lima uh, bypass patient, we would do everything to avoid to cross the, the lima artery. After that, we just do our regular TAVI as normal. We, we would do by transfemoral approach. And uh, we, after that, we can uh, just uh, take out the introducer sheet and close our artery with the, the proglide of our, or another uh, vascular closure system. The good thing is that we have here always a bailout uh, possibility with the safety wire, which is in place. And this gives us the possibility to bail out if we don't have a per closure with an eight millimeter balloon or even smaller if the uh, vessel would be a smaller uh, size. And also importantly, if we would have a complete failure of the vascular uh, closure, this even gives us the possibility to introduce sheetless uh, an, a covered stent. For example, a Covera stent, which we tend to use, uh, although we have only had needed uh, in one single case so far, percutaneous transaxillary one time a bailout stenting but it is definitely possible to in insert a uh, covera covered stent eight millimeter by the radial axis so here you see some uh, images so you see the introducer sheet doesn't have to be introduced necessarily uh, all the way so this is can it can be that this introducer large bore introducer sheet sticks out for several centimeters du during the entire procedure but this is not a problem and on the right uh, side panel you see an uh, a a successful closure of the vessel. So we did also a small comparison of, uh, well, this was a few months ago still, so where we compared our first 10 percutaneous transaxillary cases with the last 40 surgically assisted transuclavian cases. 
And actually, you see that um, despite this, these were the first time percutaneous axillary cases in our center, you see that the complication rate was actually much lower uh, using this percutaneous ap approach compared to the surgical approach. There were less major vascular complications. You see that there were six out of 40 in the surgically assisted uh, cases which ended up with a major vascular complication. Two of them had a major bleeding which needed actually covered stents uh, placements um, and also blood transfusion even. Uh, two other cases were actually cases which ended up neural damage. So it seemed, we, and we haven't seen this at all with the percutaneous approach, so avoiding neural damage, uh, and this was even permanent neural damage for the patients, so this is more seen, in, at least in our cohort, in the surgically assisted than in the percutaneously assisted uh, transaxillary or transuclavian approach. Also, the hospitalization length can be much smaller in the percutaneous approach as you don't have a surgical wound. And also, rehospitalization was actually uh, not, not seen within the first months after percutaneous approach. So it seems to be a very safe approach. So as a summary, uh, as I showed you before, we can do our entire uh, program having now nearly 400 uh, TAVR cases by a fully percutaneous approach. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. DeBacker. That was an amazing tour de force. You're a real uh, you're a savant uh, with access, and, and we really appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to transition now uh, to Dr. Yadav, who is um, fairly recently joined Piedmont, uh, much to their delight, and I think he's a great addition there. And Looking forward to hearing a little bit about uh, Transcarotid Taver. All right, thank you, Jamie. So this is an example, case example, a 76 year old male with symptomatic severe aortic stenosis with uh, classic high gradient AS, calcific valve, mild AI with a mean gradient of 40, who was referred for transcatheter valve replacement. And this is the coronary angiogram. He had history of bypass grafts that showed patent Lima TLAD and a vein graft with severe native coronary artery disease. The CT analysis had shown an annular area of 443 with a perimeter of 76, nice big sinuses, not much calcium in the LVOT, and coronary heights were all reasonable. At the time of his initial coronary angiogram, uh, the operator took peripheral angiogram because of the history of peripheral arterial disease and bilateral iliac stenting. And you can see that he has bilateral common iliac stenting with possibly some narrowing on the right side, which when we look further on the CT scan, you can see this is just the right common iliac stent and the upper part of the stent or the proximal stent is underexpanded with a diameter of less than four millimeters. And the bottom part of the stent seems to be expanded fairly nicely. The left side was a little better with an average diameter over five millimeters. Not much tortuosity, but still a short stent. So the team at that time decided to proceed with a transfemoral tower using an evolute valve. And uh, this is the initial angiogram. You see some calcification in the common femoral. Then the external iliac looks okay. But the issue then came up that a 12 French cook dilator would not advance uh, the stent on the left side. And this, this was despite various wire changes, lubrication with the uh, rotaglide. And uh, the team at that time, the operator decided not to pursue it further, not to balloon expand because of the uh, possibility of friction with the stent and felt that we should probably abort Tavar at this time and consider alternate access in a later stage. This is the final angiogram and you can see that there is some dissection at the lower edge of the stent, just telling you the injury that was happening with the dilator advancement. So then the patient was referred to us and this is our CT analysis that showed nice big right subclavian over eight millimeters and the left subclavian was also reasonable size. However, there was a osteostenosis not very tight, but still some narrowing. And remember, this patient also has Lima. Carotid axis was very good bilaterally, really good lumen, uh, luminal size. Right size was over seven millimeters, left carotid seven by eight. Uh, carotid duplex did not show any significant disease. 
on either of the internal carotid. This is uh, relatively important if you're going to put a sheath on one of the carotid, want to make sure the contralateral carotid does not have stenosis. So the patient underwent general anesthesia, right transcarotid access, really straightforward uh, valve deployment. The valve does come a little canted sometimes when you're coming from the carotid, but slow inflation will give you a chance to optimally position the valve. Deployment, final angiogram, good high placement, and the patient was uh, discharged without any issues in the next one or two days. This is the final angiogram, excellent result, no PVL, mean gradient 6.4. So in conclusion, no one access is perfect and will work all the time. An ideal transcarotid may be better than not so ideal axillary transcable or lithotripsy. And this comment is true vice versa also. Sometimes transcable may be better than not so ideal axillary and vice versa. So if you're a very busy program, maybe you need to learn all of these. But if you're less busy, then maybe master one before move to the next. I'll go... This is somewhat our algorithm that obviously femoral is the best and the preferred way. But then intravascular lithotripsy has the potential to convert an axis almost like femoral. Few minutes of lithotripsy in short calcified segments could essentially make a non-transfemoral case femoral and therefore making it very attractive option. And then obviously axillary carotid or transcable depending on patient's anatomic characteristics and also your team skill level and what's your experience set with, with apical and aortic as the ultimate last options. Thank you very much. Uh, Pradav, that was amazing. Thank you so much for that. We're gonna turn now uh, to your crosstown neighbor, Dr. Devaretti, who's going to take us through transcable TAVR. Um, whether you're doing it outside the gates of Emory or in your own uh, facility. So, uh, Dr. Devaretti. Thank you for the opportunity to present uh, techniques and some case examples of both transcable and lithotripsy facilitated tavern. First, we'll take a quick tour through the thought process and methodology of transcable tavern. In terms of past medical history, starting out with a case, uh, this was a 69-year-old gentleman who presented to our program and had a prior bypass that was performed. The patient was put on the table, sternotomy was uh, achieved, a graft was placed with limited LID, but at that time, the aorta was noted to be porcelain. As the surgical plan, the aortic valve replacement was aborted, and the patient was transferred and referred to our team uh, for further evaluation given persistent dyspnea. Patient history of prior known ischemic cardiomyopathy and known peripheral arterial disease. Ejection fraction dropped quite a bit, uh, but the numbers, despite the low EF, were still consistent with severe aortic stenosis. CT angiography revealed uh, aortic annulus and other anatomic measures consistent with uh, suitability for TAVR. Our measurements were consistent with uh, 23 sapien 3 desired valve in this case, coronary heights were adequate. Our challenge arose here in reviewing the CT angiogram with the lower extremities. Uh, most notably, as you can see here, in the uh, lower external iliac on the right and the uh, superior external iliac junction of the common iliac on the left, uh, a marked narrowing in both iliac arteries uh, to below three millimeters uh, bilaterally, uh, taking out any uh, possibility of routine transfemoral or in our opinion, a intravascular lithotripsy uh, facilitated approach. We then perform transcable planning. And on the right side, uh, you can see here that the abdominal aorta uh, was not terribly calcified. Uh, we did feel that there was a suitable location in the abdominal aorta in proximity to the inferior vena cava. Uh, that was also far enough away from both the aorta iliac bifurcation, and the takeoff of the left renal artery. Typically, we're looking for at least 25, 30 millimeters of clearance uh, in, to both of these anatomic landmarks. So why even consider transcable? Well, as Dr. McCabe went through, there are a number of uh, alternative access approaches uh, that can be pursued now that have 
evolve beyond trans aortic and trans apical uh, that are approaching these in more of a percutaneous approach. Uh, in, within our Emory group, uh, we do feel that transcable allows us to maintain femoral workflow and some of the muscle memory that we have as operators in performing these procedures and trying to maximize the benefits uh, that we have seen with transfemoral approach. Similar to a percutaneous transaxillary approach, this is completely percutaneous, can be done within the same operating space uh, that are done for routine transfemoral cases. Uh, in terms of radiation exposure, uh, some of the scatter radiation may be less given that the operators are in their normal positions as you would be for a routine transfemoral case. <clears throat> And learning this technique affords uh, some uh, parallel work for other types of procedures, uh, such as placement of left particular support devices and other large bore uh, devices. The technique, although uh, may seem uh, intimidating at first, is typically reproducible and similar from case to case. The majority of it comes down to case planning in deriving these ideal angles and location of the inferior vena cava in proximity to the abdominal aorta. We identify these positions both in relation to the lumbar spine uh, behind it and then derive the appropriate uh, gantry angles so that we can identify the location for ideal electrosurgical puncture from the inferior vena cava to the abdominal aorta, both in an anterior posterior position and a lateral camera view, although we can do a lot of this now in the AP view by itself. Once we get catheters in position, uh, typically with a 55 centimeter renal guide in the inferior vena cava and a standard guide in the aorta, waiting with typically a gooseneck smear, we can uh, activate and electrify a coronary wire, typically a stottle wire, to go from the inferior vena cava pass through the smear, capture and smear that wire in the abdominal aorta, and then transition this to a sheath. And then at the end of the procedure, uh, close the fistula with an occluder device. And we'll go through this in more detail here in just a second. So here's an example of that evaluation for this patient. Uh, just between uh, the third and fourth uh, lumbar bodies, we did feel that there was an appropriate target to aim for from the inferior vena cava. Um, and you can see a, a simulation of what we would see on x-ray, both from an AP view and as well as a lateral view here. We can line up the inferior vena cava and the abdominal aorta. If we need to, we can put pigtail catheters in both so we can get those exactly lined up. And we use, again, as we mentioned, the lumbar bodies as a, a landmark reference for exactly where we want our catheters positioned. And you can see here, uh, so clearly the inferior vena cava is in proximity. And what we're trying to do is uh, achieve a crossing right at this point. Uh, the abdominal aorta here has a soft wall next to this. Electrify this and pass the wire through for smearing. So in this specific case, as we mentioned, we would try to do this just below the third lumbar body. Uh, we would have, based on the size of the abdominal aorta, we picked a 15 millimeter gooseneck smear to capture the estata wire as it passes through. Uh, the wire is typically attached to a grounding pad and electrified. Uh, there's certain techniques that I won't go into in terms of um, being able to uh, reproducibly and safely electrify the wire. Um, it typically requires denuding the wire at the back end of it. Once the wire is in the abdominal aorta, uh, a series of mother-daughter catheters, in this case, um, a fine cross and a navy cross can be used to uh, upgrade from the 014 wire to an 035 Lundquist wire. And at that point, it becomes what you are used to as a transfermal tavern. The, in this case, 14 print sheath was advanced. Uh, we plan to do a tavern with a 23 valve and on the way out, close the fish load with a 10 8 and plaster ductal occluder device. In this case, uh, we did do this procedure with valve anesthesia, although we have done some of these cases now with conscious sedation and carefully selected patients. So first, for the transcable crossing, this was an abdominal ortogram performed, just confirming the anatomy that we had seen on the CT scan. In this case, we have the 55 centimeter guide positioned in the inferior vena cava, uh, a six French JR4 guider in the abdominal aorta with the gooseneck there positioned, waiting for passage of the wire. 
and the wire is electrified. And here you can see as it crosses through directly into the body of the um, smear in that position. At this point, the catheters uh, are passed through the aortic cable fistula first, uh, a small piggyback catheter, uh, then typically a fine cross or navy cross. Um, and then we can transfer and upgrade the wire uh, to an 035 Lunderquist, slowly pushing the sheet through in a very calcified aorta. Care must be taken to not push too aggressively. Typically, this will uh, pop. These sheets are, are uh, extremely hydrophilic and have good transitions, but typically making this transition is, is not a problem. And at this point, this becomes a, a routine tabber uh, that you're used to, a routine deployment here and with valve in good position. So the other challenge is that we've now created this aortic cable fistula and need to ensure that we have a, a dedicated and durable uh, closure of this on the way out. So first what we do is we uh, exchange the tabber delivery equipment and actually place an agilis catheter, typically a medium bend agilis, through the large bore sheath. And inside of this we have, you can just see the uh, nose of it peeking out the top of the agilis. We have a 10 slash 8 Amplatz reductor recluder that's been prepped and is waiting to go. Um, the large sheath actually needs to be brought back fairly quickly. You don't want to dilly dally and have the large bore sheath sitting in the space between the inferior vena cava and the abdominal aorta. And you may ask why that is. So if I, you were just to pull everything out and leave the aorta cable fistula, uh, to your surprise, it's actually typically not a life-threatening situation. Uh, there is a pressure sink such that the uh, intra-abdominal space is at a higher pressure than what is seen in the inferior vena cava. So typically blood will flow from the abdominal aorta through the uh, uh, peritoneum, the peritoneal space into the inferior vena cava, unless you have a catheter that's obstructing that flow. So if you pull the sheet back and obstruct the orifice of the inferior vena cava portion of the fistula, then you may bleed from the abdominal aorta into the uh, peritoneal space. But as long as the sheet is brought back very quickly and the space is uh, open, in the inferior vena cava, uh, blood will just safely pass from the aorta to the inferior vena cava while we're trying to position the closure device. So here the agilis has been brought back. It has been steered such that it's pointing more inferiorly. And at this point, the hat of the ductal occluder can be brought out. And this is brought back so that it is in proximity to the um, uh, medial abdominal aortic wall. You don't have to pull this too tight. You just want to make sure that you have that position. And once this is, uh, once it's felt to be secure and positioned against that wall of the aorta, the cable can then be pulled back and then pushed forward so that the device is in a comfortable and natural position. The agilis catheter is brought back. We would always give protamine to reverse anticoagulation just before the step is performed. And then we can do a confirmatory angiogram um, after 10 minutes of protamine. In this case, you'll see that there's actually no leak uh, whatsoever. This will be what we would describe as a type zero leak in which we see no extravasation from the abdominal aorta uh, to the inferior vena cava. So, Overall, transcable techniques can be uh, pursued uh, in a way that is safe and uh, predictable. It's the technique in these small steps of knowing how to maintain safety uh, such that there is no uh, bleeding that transpires uh, into the peritoneal space. But you know, the technique is learned carefully, uh, typically with proctorship in the beginning. This is a technique that can really turn alternative access into uh, more of a routine transfermal approach. Trying to maintain the overall uh, workflow and logistics of transfermal tabber, however, uh, has been greatly facilitated with the technology of intravascular lithotripsy. 
in a case where I'll try to highlight the use of this technology is in this 78-year-old gentleman who was transferred to us for a history of uh, unstable angina. Uh, trachoma was mildly elevated. And in talking to this gentleman, pain had actually been progressive over two or three months. There's a known history of coronary bypass surgery in the past, and also a known history of aortic stenosis, which was being followed medically. The patient also had known peripheral disease with a prior stent to the left subclavian. Urgent angiography was performed, which actually demonstrated patent grafts and no significant de novo uh, native coronary disease. But on echocardiogram, at first the patient was felt to have low gradients and preserved LV function, but on a further deep dive of the echocardiogram, it was found that the patient had a low aortic valve area uh, with a low stroke volume index consistent with severe paradoxical low flow, low gradient physiology consistent with functionally significant critical aortic stenosis. Uh, we were consulted for tablet evaluation. CT angiography was performed, demonstrating anatomic suitability again uh, for uh, Taver in this case with a 26 sapient three valve, coronary heights were uh, adequate and safe for deployment of a valve. CT angiography of the lower extremities demonstrated a significant challenge right at the bifurcation uh, from the aorta into both the iliac arteries, as you can see here, uh, near circumferential calcium, right at the bifurcation, uh, very eccentric, bulky calcium uh, in the right common iliac artery. And it's not seen here, there's actually some additional calcium lower down in the external iliac transition from the common iliac artery. So in this case, we between both uh, felt that uh, we may have a better chance of advancing uh, the valve on the right side, but in performing lithotripsy at the bifurcation, there was some concern in potentially jailing the contralateral iliac artery uh, because of the nature of calcium deposition and adhesion deposition right of the bifurcation. So our procedural plan in this case was to try to maintain the benefits of transfemoral TAVR, but to facilitate this with intravascular lithotripsy, but to actually perform this with kissing balloon inflation and bilateral lithotripsy at the bifurcation to um, change the compliance of both lesions and to reduce the chance of obstruction of the contralateral iliac artery. In these cases, we typically uh, do these with conscious sedation to really maximize the benefit of the transdermal workflow so that we can mobilize these patients and realize those benefits of, those benefits of ideally potential next day discharge. Here's the baseline aortic and geography, which uh, confirms what we had seen on CT scan. In this case, we started out first at the bifurcation. I think there's differences in techniques given the novelty of this procedure and what we think might be the, the best approach. Uh, in our center at Emory, we feel that lithotripsy is more of a calcium modification technique and we really do our best to try to avoid injury that may be derived from barotrauma. So in almost all cases, we'll use a seven by 60 uh, balloon, as Dr. DeVacher had mentioned. We'll typically not go to more than three or four atmospheres unless we're dealing with a very resistant lesion where we may go as high as uh, six or eight atmospheres. But that's actually typically rare now. We'll try to keep this at very low pressure. And what's, what's amazing is that despite this balloon being inflated of three atmospheres, you'll actually see a small waste you know, once you get to one, two, or three atmospheres, just at that low pressure, once you start delivering energy, which is at 30 seconds treatment each uh, before the machine will time you out, after one or two treatments, you'll often see that the waste uh, resolves just with application of lithotripsy with no further in, uh, higher inflation pressures. Uh, given that the balloons will typically uh, allow us to uh, perform 300 seconds or pulses, of treatment, I'll typically try to give patients their money's worth and, and maximize the treatment in the balloon. But again, staying at very low pressure. So here we're just you know, changing the location of the emitters in relation to the uh, calcific uh, deposition here. And 
These are just different 30 second treatments. And again, we're just staying at three to four atmospheres of pressure. Came down a little bit further to make sure we had treated the calcium uh, a little lower in the common iliac. And as I mentioned, there was a focal spot of calcium common to external iliac transition. And just to make sure that the sheath uh, didn't encounter any friction or resistance at this point, we just did a three atmosphere inflation here with a 30 second uh, administration of lipotripsy pulse. Came back to the bifurcation, as you can see, that waste that we saw at the beginning, despite low pressure, has now been modified and is not as obvious here as we go into our further treatments. So I typically, in our practice, will be patient, we'll, we'll do repetitive applications of lipotripsy, trying to avoid going over anything of uh, six atmospheres. And generally in our practice, unless we run into problems in trying to advance the sheath, and this is the um, angiography, but after we had uh, performed lithotripsy, we don't see any evidence of trauma to the vessel mood dissections. Occasionally you may see a uh, low grade uh, dissection that you would see in, in balloon treatment alone. We'll typically leave those alone unless there's any, any evidence that it's propagating or flow limiting, but that's typically rare at low pressure and as it was in this case. So to advance the sheath, um, we then turn this into a routine transdermal case. You'll see the sheath advance here. It does encounter a slight pause right there and then passes through. You may see that commonly with slow steady pressure that it will advance. If we don't see the sheath uh, advance, we have continued friction then we might change out to a short sheath and then go back with a non-compliant balloon and perform an additional inflation. But in our center, we have actually not been doing routine additional inflations of uh, non-compliant peripheral balloons just to try to avoid the barrel trauma from higher pressure inflation. At this point, uh, as I mentioned, it becomes more of a routine taver with best practices uh, for valve deployment. See our valves in good position. And our final aerodogram reveals <clears throat> well-positioned valve with uh, maybe a trace pad out or wake. So at the end, as long as our creatinine will allow, we do like to take a final aerodogram angiogram just to demonstrate no evidence of injury. I think we'll have to learn more as we go further along in our experience of whether we'll try to leave these iliacs uh, in a way that we're treating them just enough to pass large bore sheets, or especially as we get into lower risk patients, are we going to want to treat them in a way that we maximize the patency and um, uh, luminal gain for flow into the aortic iliac vessels. For now, we've been taking more of a minimalist approach and treating them you know, in just a way to maximize passage of the sheath. So we may see some residual stenosis uh, at the iliac arteries, but as long as we've been able to achieve a successful TAVR, the patient doesn't have any history of uh, significant lifestyle limiting claudication, uh, then we are not going back and stenting these or performing any additional uh, balloon therapies. Uh, in the, except in the rare uh, instance or where we may see a vascular injury. Uh, and some of the data that we've collected so far that Dr. McCabe showed earlier, you know, we did see frequent low-grade minimal dissections and you may see a slight edge tear, but it, we hardly ever saw anything uh, that required anything more. Uh, there were no ruptures, no perforations, uh, and no uh, flow-limiting dissections in our early experience. So in conclusion, uh, currently in 2020, when we think about alternative access for TAVR as uh, presented for these two cases for transcable and trans uh, femoral facilitated with lithotripsy, uh, uh, our center then we feel that uh, these two techniques can allow operators to utilize the familiarity of a transfemoral workflow and try to afford early mobilization, uh, potential next day discharge, and the benefits that have been seen uh, in avoiding the risk of non-transfemoral um, access, especially this may be sorry, this may be especially relevant for centers that may not have the volume or experience 
to really gain the familiarity with more complex uh, procedures such as transcarotid, uh, transaxillary, or transcable. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, you know, we're trying to preserve best practices for transfemoral and try to uh, piggyback onto those outcomes that Dr. McCabe has shown again. Thank you for your attention. Those are three terrific presentations. Um, so thankful to have some of the world's experts on vascular access and complex structural intervention here with us today. Thank you again uh, to all of you and uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.